New health orders coming later this week. Manitoba's second manhunt of the year comes to an end. And a 12-year-old marks Winnipeg's 18th homicide of the year. This and more on the Manitoba Freethinker Podcast. Welcome back to another show, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day as always. Special shout out to all the fathers out there. Happy Father's Day to you. I had a good day hanging out with my daughter. We chilled at home, watched some Netflix, ordered some Chinese food in. Uh, We took the dog for a walk. It was a nice day, nice and relaxing. But comment below. Let me know how you guys spent your Father's Day weekend. I know there isn't much open, but uh, let me know how you guys made out and how you made the best of it. Okay, Uh, yesterday, Dr. Brent Rusin held a short press conference and he held it solo. He announced that as of 9.30 a.m. Monday, uh, there was one death reported and the test positivity rate provincially was at 8% and for Winnipeg, it was at 6.9%. There were 74 new cases. He also noted that even though case numbers are continuing to decline and vaccine numbers are continuing to increase, Manitoba is still seeing the effects of the virus. Um, Over the weekend, there were nine reported deaths due to COVID-19. He said that we are still seeing a strain on our our health care system and still seeing high ICU numbers. Currently, we have 73 Manitobans in ICU, 58 of them in Manitoba, 14 in Ontario, and 1 in Alberta. During the conference, Rusin acknowledged the fact that Manitoba hit its vaccine goal for the July 1st reopening. The 70% vaccination rate for Manitobans 12 and up for the first dose and 25% vaccination rate for Manitobans 12 and up for their second dose. But he said that's not all they look for. And that's not all they look at when they make a decision on the new health orders. They take case counts and ICU numbers and test positivity rates into the decision-making process. So like I said in the previous show, the 4321 Great Summer reopening plan, it was nothing but a show. It didn't say anything. It didn't give any targets to reach in order to start to reopen. It just said that if we hit the vaccine target, which we did... They will take a look at all the factors and decide. So it, it's literally no different than it was before the 4321 plan. Come Wednesday, will be a couple days before the, the new order is set to expire, or the current order is set to expire, and they'll be filling us in on the next two-week plan. There is absolutely no difference than before. So I am interested, though, to see on Wednesday if they do give more info on uh on on targets to reach in order for us to reopen because other other prairie provinces are coming out with plans and dates to remove all health restrictions alberta is setting forth with a july 1st reopening and saskatchewan has come out with a july 11th reopening so when asked about this multiple times about why like manitoba has no plan and other provinces do Rusin would only respond with saying that we were late to the third wave and our plans had the benefit of knowing more about the Delta variant. And he said this on more than one occasion, and this is such a non-answer because Alberta and Saskatchewan are well aware of the Delta variant. And as of right now, they're still moving forward with the reopening plans. So it's just a non-answer to say that, that they, they didn't take the Delta variant into consideration. Also, our reopening plan, like our our goals are much more stricter than theirs. Dr. Rusin and Pallister both have have a habit of comparing Manitoba to other provinces only when we're in a better position than them. And they refuse to acknowledge that there's any relevance in comparing the provinces when we are in a worse position. So it's very frustrating. And they have been doing this for the last 15 months. But Rusin should have no worries because he's in an appointed position. 
But Palestine should take a, a long, hard look, at, especially at his polling numbers, and realize that Manitobans as a whole are not happy with his performance. And, and that's not just Manitobans that agree with the restrictions or Manitobans who don't agree with them. This is across the board, Manitobans. Like, um, the, the PCs are dropping in numbers. If an election were held today, I believe the NDP has a 20% lead at the current moment. So th- this has nothing to do with the orders. I believe it's it has everything to do with Pallister. And in my opinion, it's is he, he just comes across so arrogant. But this has been the constant for the last 15 months. Um, Manitoba lacking in providing Manitobans with any information on how or why they come up with these health orders and withholding any info with any sort of substance on future reopening plans. Uh, that we just continually to find out days before the order is set to expire. Overall, the news conference was pointless. Everything could have been found out from the press release, and all questions that were asked um, just had a bunch of non-answers or wait wait for Wednesday answers. So trust me, it was a hundred percent pointless. But I guess we'll have to wait for Wednesday to be disappointed. I wouldn't hold your guys' breath for any big changes. Uh, it was pretty clear that they're hinting that uh, because high ICU numbers and test positivity rates, not much is going to happen. My guess, they might increase gathering sizes or maybe uh, or limits, but other than that, not too much will change. In other news over the weekend, piece of shit Eric Wildman was arrested. So that's a good thing. That manhunt has come to an end. That's the second Manitoba manhunt this year, by the way. Uh, But in case you're not aware of this case, I'm sure most of you are, um, last last week, the disappearance of Clifford Joseph of St. Clements was upgraded to suspicious, and Eric Wildman uh, was a person of interest. So people were looking for him. After police found Wildman's vehicle, they were able to obtain a search warrant and found three rifles, uh, some assorted ammunition, police patches, police clothing, and some other tactical equipment. So this led police to believe that Wildman was a suspect in the homicide of Clifford, and a warrant for his arrest was issued and announcements were made. So uh, late last week and over the weekend, the tip line was open and the manhunt was on. Um, RCMP was led here and there throughout the province, but they ended up going to the White Shell area where it was believed that a credible sighting of his vehicle was uh, seen. Uh, just so you guys know, not long after he became a person of interest, um, police did know that he went to the airport and rented a vehicle so everyone knew what he was driving and what his license plate was. So, um, But not long after the, the sightings in White Shell, Ontario Provincial Police, or OPP, received a tip of where Wildman was staying. Uh, The RCMP Major Crimes Unit worked with OPP to obtain a warrant, and then the OPP executed the warrant in the early morning of June 18, where they were fired upon. Wildman and another occupant were eventually talked into surrendering, and no one was hurt. So, he just keeps piling on them charges. Wildman was transferred back to Manitoba and is facing additional charges. He is currently uh, charged with two counts of failing to report the destruction of a prohibited firearm, uh, transporting a firearm contrary to regulations, and possessing a prohibited device. I would assume that has to do with the police clothing, but I'm not sure. Wildman continues uh, also to be a suspect in the disappearance and or homicide of Clifford Joseph. And uh, because of the uh, what happened during the arrest warrant, the OPP have now started an investigation into the attempted murder charge against Wildman for him firing on the officers when they were executing the search warrant. The family of Clifford Joseph is still holding out hope that he's still alive. And with the arrest of Wildman, um, they're hoping they might get some answers. So Wildman is uh, well presumed innocent and whatever, and he is set to appear in court on the 27th for the weapons charges and the investigation will continue so police are asking the public for help if anyone knows uh the whereabouts of where joseph could be or if you have any information regarding 
Wildman, I guess. But um, so a little bit of good news and then typical Manitoba in comes the bad news. Uh, the other news coming over the weekend, is, which seems to be a growing trend in Manitoba, is another knife attack occurred. Uh, this time it took place in Winnipeg and it left a 12-year-old boy dead. So, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss for words. I have a 14-year-old and I can't fathom the idea of my child being in a knife fight in, in Winnipeg. Like, a 12-year-old is dead from a knife fight. So, it's, it's not often that a minor is involved, but knife attacks in Manitoba seem to be all too common. But this incident marks uh, the city's 18th homicide. So, six months into the year, Winnipeg is on track once again to reach mid-40s in homicide rate, uh, which we've hit in the past two years. We've been breaking our old records. Um, you know, bringing truth to the term murder peg, uh, four homicides took place in the last week and 11 in just over a month. So that's why we call it murder peg. You know, it's sad being a resident of Winnipeg. We, we just so often casually joke at Winnipeg being the murder capital of Canada. You know, whether it is or not, it's just we're so accustomed to having such high homicide rates that we're always up there. So Winnipeg police said they had significant progress um, made in the case, even though not much information has been given out to the public. Uh, Spokesperson Constable Jay Murray of the Winnipeg Police Service said that some details may not be made public until charges are laid or until the case makes its way through the court system. So what is known right now is that two groups got into an altercation on Burroughs Avenue Sanchez Bolanger, the 12-year-old victim, uh, was in one of those groups. And during the altercation, Sanchez was stabbed. Um, An off-duty nurse ended up helping the police give care to the boy until the ambulance arrived. He was then rushed to the hospital, but uh, he later died, unfortunately. I mean, this crime issue is, is definitely bigger than just Winnipeg. This is definitely a Manitoban problem. I'm not sure the answers, but I can clearly see there's a problem in Manitoba. A quick Google search of the top 10 most dangerous cities in Canada, uh, based on crime data, and we have three of the top 10 most dangerous cities. And not only do we have the three, Manitoba owns the top spot with Thompson. So Thompson, Manitoba being the most dangerous city in Canada. Portage of the Prairie coming in third, and Selkirk, Manitoba taken in 7th. On top of Manitoba and Winnipeg continually having record-breaking homicides per year, and if not record-breaking, at least very, very high homicides per year per capita, we continually to spend more and more on our police budget each year. So that's a problem. Uh, since 2008, we almost doubled our Winnipeg police budget from $170 million to over $305 million in 2020. Uh, in, 2000, in the year 2000, Winnipeg Police Service took 16.9% of the city budget. In 2008, it went up to 22%. And now, uh, as of 2020, it's up over 25%. So a quarter of our city budget is going straight to the Winnipeg Police Service. So we are definitely not getting our money's worth. Uh, with such high crime numbers, Like th- there's definitely a problem going on. Hamilton, which is a city comparable to Winnipeg in size, spends only 10% of their city budget on the police force. And Edmonton, which is a bigger city than Winnipeg, spends only 15% on their police force. So why the hell are we spending over 25% with absolutely nothing to show for it? Well, spoiler alert, the reason we are getting nothing for our money, we have nothing to show for it, we're spending more for fewer police officers. That's right, 85% of the police budget is now for salaries and benefits. And year by year, we have a decrease in the number of overall police officers, but an increase in their overall salaries, which is an increase in the amount of spending. So we're going backwards here. We need more police officers on, on the streets. What does this lead to for Manitobans? Pretty obvious, a lack of trust in our police force. 
with one of the highest uh, police budgets per capita, paired with some of the highest crime rates in the country. It's a no-brainer. Um, according to a recent poll conducted by Angus Reid, the most recent, I believe it was done in 2019 or 2020, uh, I, the study done among the top cities in Canada, Winnipeg ranked in the top three with the highest percentage of people that held an unfavorable view towards the police. So not only with that poll, according to the latest stats can stats, <laughs> the latest stats available from stats can confidence in the police was at the lowest in Manitoba as well when compared to other provinces and territories in Canada. So we have the most unfavorable view towards our police and we have the lowest confidence in our police. So with these, these are bad numbers all the way around. You know, you think our politicians would be a little committed in, in doing something about this bad numbers all around, you know, but last year, even with such low trust in the police force, Winnipeg city council voted against the Winnipeg getting body cams uh, which would definitely help with pl at least the police perception, because at the very least they would they would be held to a higher account, like they would be held to uh, a higher standard, and they would be more accountable. You know, instead of relying just on he said she said or relying on cell phone footage. But to be honest with you, uh, Manitoba citizens aren't the only ones feeling these effects. As I stated in the previous show, um, the Winnipeg Police Service has a severe morale problem. Um, with like they have an all-time high of officers who have thought of suicide and an all-time high of officers who have thought about quitting the job. So they definitely have some issues. And um, so with with all this into consideration, right? High wages, high high crime rates, low morale, low confidence, very unfavorable rating. Maybe, just maybe, we should focus our police force and our police dollars and time fighting actual crime. 18 homicides six months in. We just had our second manhunt in Manitoba. And now a 12 year old boy was stabbed to death. So let's let's start focusing our time on finding criminals. Instead of consistently um, policing gatherings. When in public and definitely when in private residences, stop turning regular Manitobans into criminals. Like think of all the money and time spent on Maxime Bernier, the leader of the PPC. Like, are you kidding me? We have like manhunts going on and we're, we, we have warrants out for Pastor Tobias Tyson and influencer Chris Skye. How about we go after murderers instead? You know what I mean? They're, apparently there's a lot of them in Manitoba. Something's got to change, and I have a feeling it's going to start with uh, Brian Pallister getting voted out. But, Manitoba, it's going to be a short one today. That's going to do it for me. I'm going to try and come back with another show today. But if not, I will have one Wednesday after the news conference. i am be happy to disappoint you then. But if you like the show, uh, please like, share, subscribe, do all that good stuff that helps the show. And if you want to follow me, you could follow me on Twitter at MBFreeThinker. And I have a WordPress site out. It's www.mbfreethinker.wordpress.com. Uh, there's not much on there, but you could check it out if you want. Uh, hopefully I'll be adding more stuff soon. But other than that, guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. I'll catch you guys uh, tomorrow. Bye.